Okay, there we go. Um, the uh, National Roundtable, uh, this is Emerging Technology for, for Preparedness, and we're excited to have three specific speakers with us, and kind of just an opportunity to go over a quick format. Uh, first up, we've got Hank Rowland. Uh, he's with FEMA's uh, National Resource Hub. Uh, he serves as their NIMS Documents and Tools Section Chief in an acting capacity uh, there at the National Integration Center. Uh, following Hank's presentation, there'll be an opportunity for some questions and answers. And joining me on the call, not only are our speakers, but some of our uh, uh, folks in the community, and they will be there to help uh, uh, respond to those questions and answer and kind of facilitate that discussion after each speaker. So we're excited to have those colleagues present and uh, joining us today. Uh, next, uh, we've got uh, Catherine Bone. She's the uh, Associate Vice President over at Drewberry working on the RGO contract support. And she's going to really uh, take some time to focus on utilizing AI for damage assessment. So we're excited to see that because we realize how important damage assessment is and getting that information uh, through the funnel at the beginning of the post-incident mitigation in order that uh, your community is positioned well for the activities that will follow thereafter. Um, and then lastly, uh, Brian Blake, uh, the Associate Director over at uh, the Central U.S. Earthquake Consortium. Uh, he's really going to be talking a little bit about the rapid visual screening that they're using over at CUSAC. So we're very pleased to have that. And I would be remiss if I didn't also uh, thank all of our folks over at uh, uh, Science and Technology who are joining our call as panelists, uh, who may uh, have the opportunity to offer up some thoughts throughout the course of this presentation or as we close. Uh, but with that, uh, Hank, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, let you kind of kick us off. All right. Well, thank you, Tommy. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen here. All right. And then, Tommy, uh, Trisha, can you guys see that all right? We can. Yes, we can. Yeah. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you so much again, uh, Tommy, for the intro. Um, glad to uh, be back at Inspire. Um, I was able to uh, to attend the, uh, the last one that was in person back in uh, 2019 uh, down in Galveston. Had a lot of good conversations there um, talking about the national qualification system. Um, excited that in those, uh, I guess a year and a half, 18 months or so since then, there's been a lot of, um, a lot of cool updates um, with the, within the NQS and, uh, and one responder world. Um, and that's what I will be talking about today is the, uh, the national resource hub um, that uh, we're just now uh, starting to, we rolled out the version 1.0 um, just about, I wanna say two, three weeks ago. So talking about brand new stuff that's out on the street now. Um, wanna to point to this here, um, to the title slide. You know, we do have, this as the kind of piece of our branding. You'll see more of this as we go on, um, but uh, National Resource Hub, that's that official name. And then our tagline, Unifying Resource Management Nationwide. So that's uh, kind of our underlying, I guess you say mission and vision for this, uh, for our effort here. There we are. So when we first started off scoping this um, and really kind of, you know, scoping things in general within the, um, within the NIMS implementation branch of which the, the document and tools section um, is a part, you know, everything is about, is a, is a focus on, uh, of course, on NIMS um, and NQS, uh, or excuse me, national qualification system, um, you know, specifically for personnel. But it's also, uh, you know, beyond beyond just personnel, the NQS, you know, NIMS, the, the main component, uh, one of the big components of NIMS is the resource management component. And, and you see a, um, a visualization here on the right of those four different uh, processes in, in the resource managing, um, resource management preparedness, uh, you know, sort of um, process. And so, you know, what, what we did, what, as we were, we were talking about this and talking about, again, you know, the, the business requirements is, you know, we have um, how do we how do we connect all of these different um, these different uh, systems and different processes into into one sort of you know system of system or creating a process. So um, kind of this is this where uh, these discussions um, really led us to what you're going to see here today. We're talking about the National Resource Hub and, and kind of what we came up with again is kind of you know the I guess you would say you know the the a little bit longer wordier vision is that um, you know that resource and um, Resource and incident workforce catalog, as well as an analytics hub that you can be, that you can use for real time situational awareness uh, for all resources. So not just personnel, but you know also you know that equipment, the uh, the teams, strike teams, things like that. 
um, that you know everything that comes with a with uh, with resource management. I like to point to this as well too before we uh, before I continue to to go on because we often do get this question when talking about one responder or the, or the national qualification system um, over the past um, uh, let's see four years now um, is uh, is you know is you know FEMA's FEMA's priorities changed you know things working with NIMS you know there's always something new or something you know that something on the horizon that you know sometimes it's out with the old and with the new. But I always like to point out, you know, the NQS and, and especially one responder now, the National Resource Hub, are really becoming um, tying in um, to uh, FEMA strategic planning. Um, so since 2018, so about three years now, because I think it was released March or April of 2018, and the four-year strategic overall strategic plan, um, the national qualification system and one responder um, are the, uh, the basically, you know, the, the the underlying driver for that objective 2.1 about organizing the best, um, the workforce. Um, and so tying right into that is that objective 2.3 as well. And so that's just, that's, you know, that's beyond just the personnel, which 2.1 is specific to, and it's talking again about, you know, the commodities, equipment um, and personnel. So all of those resources. So, you know, it's, it's in there and it's been in there as, you know, that some of that top level um, uh, driving um, over the long range planning for FEMA. Um, we also have are in the uh, 2021 um, administrators uh, planning guidance or the APG um, underneath uh, priority three, um, working on you know the SLTP emergency management workforce, and also implementing data driven approaches to close gaps. So uh, beyond just 2021, we have uh, this is our second year in a row being in that annual planning guidance, and that is the guidance that uh, they use by the, uh, the the by each year to really drive the top budget priorities for that year. So. This is something that is getting, um, uh, you know, a briefing to, to top level leadership, you know, at least once a month um, and, and then big, you know, kind of rolled up into the rest of the planning uh, each quarter, but especially at the um, the uh, resilience. So up at the directorate and beyond level, the office level for preparedness, um, this is something that's briefed on a biweekly, um, a biweekly basis. So it's something that is, has the, um, has the, uh, the, the, uh, 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 that leadership is very interested in, and it's something like I said that they've made a, a top priority. So always just like to point that out before uh, moving on. So as I mentioned, you know that there we wanted to try to tie things together. You know, I kind of use that term system of systems. Um, so what what I like to say too is that you know the National Resource Hub is it, it's certainly not a new idea, right? It's something that we've been trying to, you know, we as a, as a whole community have been trying to do for you know, from really from the beginning, right? Is how to how to how to connect. And, and get systems and, and 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 different jurisdictions to talk and share resources, you know, as, as seamlessly as possible. Um, and so, again, for beyond, you know, reinventing the wheel, there's already several systems that are available out there right now, um, listed here on the slide. The current FEMA solutions, um, two of them have been around for quite some time, um, for a, a many many years. Um, the resource typing library tool um, and the incident resource inventory system. So RTLT and IRIS. Um, are two things that have been around quite a while. And one responder is the kind of the new kid on the block, but uh, you know that's uh, certainly in a relative sense, but much newer than the uh, RTLT and IRIS. Um, just to give a quick um, quick rundown, I won't. Uh, I believe we are sharing these slides, so I, I won't read too much um, of, of the text here. But just a quick, um, you know, what what each tool is, because that'll help sort of explain as I move on to the National Resource Hub. I, I imagine most folks on here are probably familiar at least with some of these, and, and at least they you know have heard of these. But if not, just a quick, um, quick rundown. So the RTLT is is just that it's a it's a library for housing all of um, all of our resource typing guidance. So that's not that's the job title position uh, qualifications or the FEMA 509s, um, as well as those 508s, which are the resource typing definitions. So that's every all the equipment teams, strike teams. Whereas the 509s focus on the personnel. Um, and soon um, coming uh, the this year, we will also have the uh, position task book templates will be up there as well. Um, so as it says here, it is, it's a, it's a data model and database. So it's, it's a publicly facing um, uh, it, it tool that is, it, uh, uh, that it does have some connections um, for, for third party systems to consume live data. And, and one of the biggest customers, and this will continue into our, our conversation here shortly, is the, uh, the uh, NEMA's um, EMAC um, or their um, mutual aid support system and uh, EMAC operating systems. They uh, pull those RTLT, uh, the RTLT data um, for their the um, the mission ready package MRP building tools, 
Um, but so it, it is just that though. It's just guidance that FEMA publishes. There, there's nothing, no, no tracking ability or you know any anything in there that you can you, to, to create. You know your own using those type. Of, it's just it's just that it's the tools to be able to do that. Um, building on that is the IRIS, the Inventory Resource Inventory System. Um, which is a, uh, it is not centrally hosted, as you'll see here, it has to be downloaded and, um, and there has to be, it, it's a local instance on, um, on you know, a, whoever's computer it might be within that specific jurisdiction. Um, it, it pulls that RTLP data and you see here from the kind of screenshot where, you know, you've got, you, you can inventory those resources, personnel, um, you've got different support data your, in your directory. So it's basically takes, takes that information from the resource typing library tool and then you can, you can type your personnel and inventory them, your, your personnel and your other resources using that basic resource typing calculator. So to kind of show what it, um, you know, what it looks like. Um, as I said, so that is a, right now, it is something that has to be, uh, it is it is publicly available, but it must be downloaded. And then it becomes a local instance on um, on a user's computer. Uh, one responder is, um, is basically, uh, I like to call it kind of now, and this again will fit into the uh, qual uh, conversation as we go on, the, um, the qualifications management portal. So this focuses right now on, on personnel, um, on their qualifications from trainee all the way through uh, fully trained, um, tracking those and, and being able to sign off on, on different, um, different qualifications. Um, it is cloud hosted um, and it, uh, right now it has just recently moved onto the prep toolkit. We talked a little bit about that. Um, however, you just, uh, once you sign up, um, we will, we, the NIP, um, the one responder help desk, which uh, I think I have that listed on here. If not, we will get that in the chat. Um, helps. Um, we can assist uh, folks who don't have an organization get that set up. But then once uh, once an organization is rolling in there, it's it's, it's your it's your baby. It's uh, you know your data. You do with it what you want. And and you know there's there's a lot of different ways to share that information um, to to create uh, memberships, auxiliary memberships. I don't want to go too far into it. Um, however, we always are are more than willing. For folks who would like a uh, you know see a demo to kind of see more about that system to provide that um, and that's kind of again through our, our NIMS uh, inbox through our help desk which I said I'll make sure I put in the chat uh, at the end here because I don't think it so that's a quick snapshot of, of where we are these are three systems that are you know relatively independent of one another um, that that are kind of out there as, as, as but, but that all kind of help with parts of the resource management process so this is what that current architecture looks like. Um, so right now you see, as I mentioned, um, you know, the, the new um, RTLT and IRIS have always been available through um, FEMA's prep toolkit, uh, preparedness toolkit. Um, and one responder is, uh, again, as the new kid on the block was just recently, um, recently brought into that boundary as of, I think it was March 20th. I, I have the date, or excuse me, the, um, the link here at the end of the new one responder link. I, some folks may have the old one. Um, hope we, we did migrate all users, so hopefully folks have been able to get in and, and, and get onto that new site. But if not, we can, again, can help with that at the help desk. Um, so you kind of see what it currently looks like. So you've got the RT, uh, RTLT database, which pushes out information um, within, the, uh, within, the, uh, within that uh, ATO boundary um, you know, to those uh, the downloadable and distributed software through IRIS. Um, and then it also pushes outside in that bottom dotted line to those third party systems. Um, and, you know, see, we, we've, we've, you know, the EMAC systems as well as those um, local um, distributed, so those distributed instances of, of IRIS. Um, there is one piece right now that kind of helps with the, uh, the, IRIS, um, the IRIS hub that helps, it pulls in um, some uh, very kind of top line number uh, metrics. Um, so you see here right now, you know, there's 18 uh, or 1,858 different um, known IRIS instances out there, those local instances. And it's really just kind of a uh, top, um, Top level, like the, the directory of folks um, to be able to share that, you know, the POCs for each one, stuff like that. Doesn't really get into the numbers or anything like that. And then there's the one responder database, which again is kind of on its own right now, um, as far as like, you know, information coming and going, um, but uh, it is within that prep toolkit. <clears throat> so, where we want to go, and again, I mentioned, you know, the, the branding here. This is our, you know, um, this is what you will start to see um, as a uh, kind of the, the 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 branding the the marketing for this is the uh, you know this um, the 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 symbol here as well as the uh, you know that tagline at the bottom unifying resource management nationwide. So these four bullets really kind of describe again you know a more um, sort of that vision where we want to go. So that single platform for using an inventorying typing as well as managing personnel qualifications and and then the credentialing piece for those qualifications. 
Um, it'll also serve as a sort of a resource or incident workforce catalog. Um, and that's a little bit about the data, data analy analytics hub, which I'll talk about a little bit, um, which you know provides that real-time situational awareness I mentioned for, uh, for resources and readiness uh, you know, across the country. Um, and then of course, you know, as I mentioned, we want to, we have those three systems already out there. There's resource management systems or solutions. So we want to consolidate it into uh, to one platform. And that's really kind of where we're focusing um, in the, uh, this is really envision this as a, as a three-year effort, beginning is a three-year effort, but the first big um, hurdles that we want to take is bringing all those resource management systems into one platform. Um, and then uh, uh, this is where we are, you know, we, we are, we're there is that, uh, you know, at least part of it is um, we're, we're moving there is essentially cloud hosted, um, uh, you know, uh, in, in, within that FEMA authorized environment. And so when I say that we're there, um, I will go ahead to the next slide and we're not all the way there, but we are, we are already making moves um, to, to get there um, in that, uh, that, that first slide that I showed, sorry, I'll jump back one more time is that um, you know, if this had been three weeks ago, you would have seen this one responder database would have been outside of that ATO boundary. So already making strides to, uh, to get this, um, you know, to get that fourth bullet accomplished. So this is the, uh, this is the long range concept. This is what we envision things um, looking like. Um, you, you see it's a, it's a much cleaner looking diagram, um, kind of, you know, of, what, of how things work, how things flow. Um, you will recognize that some things do look a bit familiar, though, and that's uh, that's exactly how how it should be. Because um, I said we want to make sure all those solutions are still being used. So you know the typing piece, the inventorying piece, and then of course the qualifications piece. So here's what we've got, what we've come up with for that long range vision. So within that prep toolkit ATO boundary, so on that FEMA.gov site, um, you still have that RTLT database. So that, um, as I mentioned, the only thing that'll be changing with that now um, is the, uh, the, the um, addition of the uh, position task books, the PTDs um, on there. And so that, that we want to drive that as the, um, as, as the go-to foundation for all of, this different, um, all of this different guidance. So whether it's pushing it out directly, see the, the, um, the blue arrow here, um, the, the solid blue arrow on the bottom, pushing up into that resource inventory and qualifications management tool. So that's basically, that's, that's the iris. Um, and, and instead of having the local instances is bringing that into that one cloud hosted environment. Um, and then the qualifications management is one responder. So it's bringing those two um, capabilities into, you know, into one sort of interface that, that allows you that, to use that whole resource management process. So you've got your people being qualified and then maybe they're part of a strike team. So then that pushes right into the, into the strike team um, within that resource inventory. So all in one spot. Um, you've also got, you see the dotted lines still remain. You've got the RT, uh, LT database still pushing out that API to those third-party systems. Um, and EMAC, as I, as I mentioned, one of our you know, big customers with that API, um, we're working uh, hand in glove with them right now on kind of what that, what that API, especially at least an initial API would look like, like what kind of information is most useful um, you know, uh, within, the, within the EMAC mission space and then you know, kind of pushing that to you know, the whole community as well. Um, you also have now the connection from that, uh, the resource inventory and qualifications management tool, which will also push out with that API. So not only do you have the ability within EMAC, you know, this is the vision. So in using the, um, you know, EOS um, or, or MASS as an example is, you know, you can, you can build those MRPs from the, uh, from the RTLT, but then you also have the ability to, if, if a, um, so say from my county down here, Spotsylvania County, Virginia has a um, has um, a, a, an incident management team, or has a, you know a couple of, uh, of it has an operations section chief and a plan section chief that uh, is part of, of, of the Virginia's um, Virginia's INT. That information can push directly about their qualifications and um, you know their inventory. That can push directly into that EMAC system. So rather than having to hand jam everything in you know into several different systems, you've got a spot where you do it once and it pushes out everywhere else. So finally, the piece you see the uh, solid blue arrow to the left pointing to that um, to that national resource and incident workforce catalog, as well as the data analytics mapping and visualization hub. That's that piece that uh, I mentioned that kind of provides that real time situational awareness. So one of the main drivers of this was um, uh, leadership's vision uh, within the National Preparedness Directorate, which is, is NICS, um, uh, the, the office above the National Migration Center, um, is uh, especially in, in the wake of, of 2017. 
um, is sort of, you know, is there a way to get just a snapshot of, of what all is available out there, um, you know, uh, across the country? Um, you know, not in any sort of like digging down in any sort of way, but just a quick snapshot, like how many operations section chiefs do we have in the country or even how many incident management teams are out there, you know, that are, that are ready to go, um, you know, or are willing to go, things like that. Um, which is, and again, that was the driver sort of behind this. However, what we want to do with this as well is, is make sure that this, you know, it's usable, not just for FEMA, but for everybody using it, right? So you've got, you've, that's where in that analytics and mapping and visualization comes in is, you know, having those, uh, that ability to use all that data you have in one responder, or excuse me, within that resource inventory and qualifications management tool and put that to good use for, for, for analyzing, right? So how many, uh, where, where are my gaps in, uh, in my, you know, for my, my training, for my incident management team, um, you know, maybe my EOC, uh, EOC personnel, how much do I have a, a bench of, uh, for EOC, you know, if something, if folks have to deploy or if we, if we want to send folks out for mutual aid, things like that. And being able to do that in, within this system, again, you've got all this data here that you've taken the time to enter in and, 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 and manage. So, you know, we want to try to make a tool and an interface where you can, you can do that, um, that provide some useful information for, for, for everybody. Um, and, and right now, um, the, just to kind of give you know, where we are with one responder, right now, pretty much everything in one responder you can export to Excel. And so that might be helpful for folks who know what they're doing with, you know, can chop things up in Excel. But, you know, it, it, you've got all the data, but there's no, there's no, you know, visualization tool there. So that's the vision is, you know, being able to make that, put that to use for folks um, within this national resource hub. So that brings me to the end of uh, my presentation. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I did want I want to share with everybody the uh, the new uh, direct link to the um, to the National Resource Hub, where you can find um, all three of these different systems: Re RTLT, um, Iris, and the One Responder. Um, as I mentioned too, uh, we 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 have been working. We've had you know some growing pains as we moved over, um, but it should most folks, if you still have that old link to One Responder, the .NET, you still should be redirected here. Um, some folks may be having some issues. We tried to migrate all users in, but if you are having issues, please contact us at the um, at the uh, the NIMS inbox, and I will add that in here to the chat um, for folks to have. That's our our, our one responder help desk. Um, so with that, um, that brings me to the end, and uh, I'll uh, I'll pause now for uh, for any questions. Great, thank you so much, Hank. Um, this is Rebecca, and I've got a couple of questions that we've heard from some of our panelists today uh, that I wanted to kind of go through with you if you have a couple minutes. Sure. Um, the first question is, and I think you started to talk a little bit about this on the NRH uh, data visualization hub, but will that provide situational awareness for the community around what resources are available, or is that going to be just for FEMA's use? So that was kind of, I did try to touch on that. And like I said, the, the, the initial driver, you know, to be, you know, for full disclosure was, you know, kind of, at least for us to obviously, you know, this is not something, again, this is not, these are not new concepts, but, you know, that initial driver was, you know, for, for FEMA leadership to be able to have, you know, in, in the wake of, you know, another 2017, that, that sort of snapshot. But, you know, as we've started to put it together, it's, it would be, it's useful for FEMA, yes, but we want to make sure that it's useful for everybody. Like I said, down from, whether it's down to, you know, from the local level, um, down, you know, to the firehouse level, down up to the state level and beyond, um, certainly want that tool to be able to, um, to be useful for, uh, for, for all users. And one of the pieces, you know, that there's, this is still being, um, you know, scoped out, it's kind of, you know, TBD, how exactly it'll look. Um, but one of the ideas that we've touched upon as well is, is creating um, those hubs within the FEMA region. So, you know, kind of breaking it down from there, um, you know, as folks have, you know, if they have those relationships already within the regions, you've already got a ready-made sort of, um, you know, place there. And of course, there's other different, you know, associations, different, um, you know, uh, interstate, uh, regional type things like that. But so that was kind of, again, those are sort of the beginning ideas, but to, to kind of make that to make that short answer long, absolutely, um, you know, that we want this to be useful um, and have be able to, you know, for folks to be able to use that data. It, it's your data, so we want to make sure that you can get the best use out of it you can. 
Thank you. Um, and as it relates to available um, API and RESTful services, we've had a few questions from our stakeholders about uh, that as it pertains to the National Resource Hub. Um, from what I understand in the, in the hub today, currently RTLT, the resource typing library tool, does have an API available. Um, is that something that um, any other you know, agencies can gain access to through the National Resource Hub website? So I would have to double check on this with our with the team um, uh, on that one. I do know I do as I understand it that that is, it is available now um, for for folks to use the, the current one. But I think moving forward, and, and I think I'm looking at the question from Daniel. Is that the one you were you were touching on, Rebecca? Any kind of talking yes. about moving forward? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it's absolutely. Yeah, going forward, is that what we want to? Um, is that that's the vision? Like I said, you kind of see, and I'll go back real quick here on the slide deck. Um, you know, kind of showing, I don't know if the question answers, kind of showing, yeah, that it's that, it's, you know, you see it's just that sort of one way, um, you know, pushing out that data. Um, and, and that's kind of, you know, to, to that why we kind of envision this as, as the sort of hub is, you know, people will, it can input information in there, you can import info, and then it's kind of the spot, you know, where it's the central, you know, sort of spoke for the, to push out to the, you know, the rest of the community. It's kind of, is the, is the main vision. Hope that's helpful. Absolutely. And with the um, updated version of IRIS, the cloud hosted centralized version, um, I, if I'm not mistaken, that will be released in, in the May timeframe. So I think for some of the other questions we had, it may be something that, you know, given the fact that we are literally weeks out from release, um, you may want to hang tight. Um, but that will be released via the link uh, for the National Resource Hub that you see listed. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of last questions, there was another question here around um, the, you know, making the EMAC EOS layers a bit accessible. Um, I don't know if you want to touch on that, just, you know, given the fact that NEMA and EMAC are their own organizations. Um, so. Absolutely. Yeah, th this is, a, that's a, it's a very timely question. Is it something, you know, that we, we've kind of been in talks with, with NEMA about and, and that it's, it's something um, kind of where, why I was really kind of pointing to, um, you know, the, again, that the, the sort of the, the push model from the, from the National Resource Hub to, to, and I really call it EMAC is again, like Rebecca kind of touched on it, you know, that's, it's, it's NEMA's, you know, prerogative, you know, as to what that, what, you know, that, that data being pulled back. And so, you know, understanding too, that, you know, it's, it's NEMA, it's also, you know, NEMA being made up of the states, um, you know, that's, that's more for, for their, their prerogative. So right now it is just more of a push rather than making those, um, the, the, the information back out from, from the U.S. and that. Thank you so much. And I, I would just say, I think folks can continue to ask questions and we'll be uh, moderating and answering those questions um, as we go forward today. So thanks. Absolutely. Thank and you. I will, oh, lastly, I, I will put that NIMS inbox in the chat for everybody as well. So I uh, want to thank everybody for, uh, for your time. And thank you so much for your help. And Rebecca, thank you so much for helping to facilitate some of those questions. Uh, Catherine, uh, off to you. Great, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can I get confirmation that you can see my screen? Yes, yes. looks great. Great, great. Well, thanks, Hank. And like, like Hank, I'm excited to be here today. I also attended in person the previous Inspire session in Galveston and really look forward to the next in-person conference. Uh, what I'm gonna talk to you today is some machine learning techniques for damage assessments that we saw supporting the FEMA response to your spatial office. So I'm gonna go through what geospatial damage assessments are give a little bit more background in machine learning concepts so that we all are on the same page, and then show specific examples from the 2020 hurricane season. So you can see some of the lessons that we learned from reviewing others' um, machine learning concepts. My goal for you from this session is to learn. Um, you know, we learned a lot last year and I'm hoping to share that information with you so that you can go back to your local or state 
organization and review what you've learned, review your geospatial data, plan for the upcoming hurricane season, and then prepare through exercises and other mechanisms. So what are geospatial damage assessments? It's really a way to categorize damage impact for structures in the event area. You do this by integrating different geospatial data. Specifically, one of the most critical data sets is the post-event imagery data. And it's a way to use technology to automate this process. You can do this anywhere that data exists. As long as that imagery and other ancillary geospatial data is available, you can create geospatial damage assessments. The key is you want to do this as fast as possible so you can provide those geospatial damage assessments to decision makers so that they can make more informed decisions. And that's the whole point of this. You want to be able to understand what the event magnitude was to help make decisions for response, recovery, and mitigation efforts. I really see four main categories of geospatial damage assessments. There are modeled damage assessments. So imagine taking things like a flood inundation grid and overlaying it with structures. So this flood inundation grid uses information from river gauges showing the peak crest or tide gauges showing the surge or maybe a fire perimeter overlaid with structure data to then estimate the amount of impacts. You can also use data collected from the field. So an inspector on the ground, looking at the sides of structures or even going inside a property to record damages. You can also do visual assessments. So using that great post-event imagery that's often collected after an event to assess damages. And then what we're gonna talk about today is using machine learning techniques to create damages. There are just so many uses of damage assessments. They can be input to help prioritize where to collect remote sensing data, help to determine presidential disaster declarations, help to identify shelter locations, and prioritize where to send field teams. They can be used into planning models to help understand what resources you may need and even what staffing size should you use and what types of staff should you provide to help the response and recovery efforts. There's a lot of existing debris models out there that can take input from damage assessments to help you understand the volume and types of debris that are out there. It can help you determine where to collect high water marks, expedite assistance, be used to help understand substantial damage inside the special flood hazard area, and to help prioritize where to identify mitigation projects. I'd love to see more uses in the chat because I know that this is only scratching the surface. So if you have additional uses, please, please put them in the chat and we can add them to the slides. So let's move on to what do we mean with machine learning? And let's start with terminology. So first we have artificial intelligence, and that's really the theory and development of computer systems to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. That's sort of the umbrella word. Then let's talk machine learning, which is high dimensional statistics. Well, in the context of damage assessments, take the fact that every pixel and every imagery band is a variable, which ends up being millions of variables input into the algorithm to make predictions. And then there's deep learning, which is really just a type of machine learning algorithm that uses artificial neural networks. When we think of machine learning for damage assessments, before we get into the examples for the 2020 hurricane season, I thought it would be useful to really look at how a basic machine learning process would work. Again, there's a lot more complexity 
to each of these blue boxes than what's indicated here, but to make sure we all have a common understanding of what machine learning for damage assessments is all about, let's start with the first box. So what's your goal? What questions are you trying to answer by using machine learning for damage assessments? That will really help you focus how you develop your machine learning algorithms. And then how are you gonna operationalize the output result? How are you gonna take that information and make more informed decisions to help expedite the response and recovery process? So first you have to think about what your goal is. And then once you understand that, you can start making decisions on how you should be developing the algorithm. So there's really one decision that you first have to make is, are you going to use the detection or classification method? These are two different ways to tackle the same problem and both have their pros and cons. So from the damage detection, you can detect damages in the entire area of interest. And what's great about that method is that you could detect damages, not just to structures, but you could be looking at things like roads and bridges and power lines. The second method is classification. And that eliminates the need to detect across the entire imagery. And you can start to focus in on things like building footprints to help you focus where you're doing your damage assessment. The issue there is if for some reason you don't have a building footprint over a certain area, then you're not going to be detecting those damages. Next, you have to think through what schema are you going to use? Typically, FEMA classifies damages into affected, minor, major, and destroyed. You know, are you going to want to develop your machine learning algorithm to that schema? And if so, then you want to have the necessary data to support that. Lastly, what data sources are you going to use? If you're gonna use classification, what building footprints are you going to use? If you're going to use pre-event imagery, how close was that imagery acquired to the event? So lots of decisions to make on just the algorithm alone, but you're not done yet. You still need to develop training data and think about what geography you're going to use and the imagery sensor you're going to use. So what we mean by that is if you train your model on a specific area, it's not gonna work in another area. So if you wanna have a nationwide damage assessment algorithm, you have to have training data for the entire United States. If you wanna have a machine learning model on just the state of Louisiana, then you have to have data for Louisiana. If you wanna have a model that uses multiple imagery sensors, you have to have data for that entire model. Developing training data is the most manual time consuming process of this whole effort. So then, the event happens. Now you're ready to deploy your machine learning model. And there's a lot to it in just the deployment. You have to load that post-event imagery data. You have to process it and output the results. When you process the machine learning model, you really need to think about a scalable infrastructure. And you know the GPUs, the, you know, you're gonna be using a cloud environment to help provide those output re results as quickly as possible. Once you have the results, you've got to review them. You have to make sure that the results make sense and are able to support the decisions you want to make. And you need to share it with the community so that others can be using that information to make decisions. And then lastly, you need to be able to use that information to make decisions. So you wanna work with your emergency managers to ensure that they understand the output results and they're comfortable making decisions with the data. So now that we have that foundation in machine learning concepts, let's talk a little bit about what we learned during the 2020 hurricane season. And we identified four buckets of consideration, imagery, workflow, 
training data gaps, and quality review. So on the imagery front, if your imagery has clouds in it, you're not gonna be able to assess the damages underneath. So you wanna make sure that if you're acquiring post-event imagery that you try to do it with the least amount of cloud cover. Also shadows would cause the damage assessment models to be inaccurate. So you wanna reduce the amount of shadows. So like I mentioned, Previously, the machine learning models work off of specific sensors. So you wanna make sure that the imagery you're acquired has been trained for that particular algorithm. And then you wanna think about when the imagery is acquired. You're looking at three different examples acquired over three different periods of time. The imagery on the left here was required right after the event where the imagery on the far right has a blue tarp on it and was required later in the event. You also want to think about how quickly the imagery can be processed so that you can then run your machine learning algorithms and output the results in a timely fashion to help make decisions. Resolution is a key factor, higher resolution, you could potentially detect additional damages. And then lastly, coverage. If you're trying to do automated damage assessments, but only a small portion of your area of interest is covered, you're not gonna be able to do it. So you need to think about how much coverage you want to acquire. The workflow issues came into the fact that we saw two different primary uses of machine learning techniques for damage assessments, detection and classification. So for the detection method, one of the things that we saw during the 2020 hurricane season was detecting destroyed damages over water. We know that wasn't the case, but it was part of the detection machine learning algorithm that happened. We also saw a lot of debris piles where there was no damage detected. In the case of what's on the screen here, there was clearly buildings that had been destroyed by wind or surge where the machine learning algorithm did not detect damages. In the classification workflow, what happened was sometimes there was overlapping polygons, which meant that that would increase the number of damages when you tried to roll up the numbers for a particular jurisdiction, or you would see a building that had two different classifications. So you're looking at, for that duplicate building example, a classification of unaffected and affected applied to the same building. So confusion on what level of classification was a particular building damaged. If there was an automated building algorithm used during the classification technique, sometimes that had an offset, so your other geospatial data was not able to be overlaid. Or if the imagery was distorted in some way, then your building footprints were also distorted. So now we're gonna talk about training data gaps. So under representations of training data so that your, your model is not lining up with real world examples you need to think about what are the attributes that you want to classify? Do you wanna keep with the FEMA schema or some type of other schema? We saw a lot of small structures being represented. So things like sheds or hay bales identifying damages. Again, if the intent or goal of your model is to roll that information up, then you're gonna be potentially over-representing the damages. You need to make sure that the geography that you're interested in is represented in the training data. One thing we saw during the 2020 hurricane season was in Louisiana, the models were not familiar with petrochemical facilities and as a result, classified a lot of destroyed structures in those areas. You could also have issues with complex buildings like horseshoe shaped buildings where the model may not represent accurately. Understanding what 
the difference between a poorly maintained building versus actual damage, and then smooth roof texture, like in the case of this building where clearly they're in the process of having a roof replaced, but the model did not detect any damages. Lastly, you need to think about how you're going to review any damage assessments because and understand what your acceptable tolerance is. Nothing is perfect. And so you need to think through what error tolerance you're willing to accept. How we do this is a couple of different ways. One is developing what's called a confusion matrix. This is a great way to identify general trends in the data set. And so let's walk through this. The first thing you can do is select at random 10% of your data. And I provided a link to the script that we use to do that. Once you have that 10%, you can then have an analyst visually classify that information and compare it to the machine learning predicted results. It's just such a great tool to identify those general trends like, hey, this machine learning model is missing all the destroyed structures. And then you can dig in further and determine why. You can also compare the results with other types of damage assessments. So things like a, a other post-event imagery damage assessments or field damage assessments. I just caution you for that comparison. You, maybe the imagery is a different resolution or maybe the field damage assessments are taken into account inside the buildings. So the results may not line up exactly. So what can you do next to support this? Review your geospatial data, see if you have the necessary inputs for damage assessments and start to automate some of these processes. Plan for how you're going to use the information to make decisions and how you're gonna actually operationalize it in the case of an event. And then prepare through having some exercises and look back, maybe you need to enhance some of your data or develop some more automation tools. Hopefully you can do all that before your next event. I'd like to um, put in a plug for an on-demand session um, that is showing some examples of other virtual collaboration tools that people attending this live session may be interested. And I put the link in the chat. And I'd like to you know, thank you again for attending this session and open it up to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Catherine. We are getting uh, quite a few questions in the chat. So I think we have a couple of times to go through first. Um, from Daniel, we have a couple. Did you do any comparison of amount of time saved or not saved during visual screening, i.e. GIS staff reviewing imagery and classifying building footprints based upon the imagery versus the machine learning time to validate review the AI assessments? And if so, which was more accurate and faster? <laughs> well, and, and that's, a, that's a great question. And there's a lot of, I could have a whole nother presentation session on that. So. So machine learning is faster. There's no question it can be faster if the imagery is acquired in, in a timely fashion. However, the accuracy right now is we're seeing some inconsistencies in the way it's coming out. What we're thinking about implementing for the 2021 hurricane season is using machine learning to help focus those visual assessments. And then that way we can speed up the entire process. Um, but Daniel, definitely off to the side, I will email you a much longer explanation to that answer. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and then he had a second question, which has also come up. Uh, is there a minimum recommended resolution to perform an adequate AI damage assessment? Yeah, it's funny, we're, we're talking about that right now with um, a couple of different organizations and it really depends on what, what your goal that you're trying to do with the particular damage assessment. There is not a minimum, um, but the resolution could change depending on if you're looking at a rural area or an urban area, or are you focused on structures, so residential structures, or are you looking at things like power lines? So the resolution really is dependent on what goals and questions you're trying to answer. 
And I think that makes sense. And I wanted that actually re reminded me of something else you had mentioned. Uh, you had you had mentioned uh, it was important to do some things now and uh, like readying your geospatial data. What what else can folks do to get their data and their attributes ready for AI? Yeah, and I think I think that's that's a great thing for locals and states to start thinking through is is your data specifically building footprints. You know, do you have good attribution on your building footprints to indicate what type of structure it is? What's the roof type? What's the exterior wall? And you know, one of my favorite, what's the elevation of the lowest floor for those flood models? So I think better attributing your data, your specifically your building footprint data is one. And then secondly, developing a plan of how you're going to acquire post-event imagery to include that question that Daniel had on identifying what is the needed resolution so that come event time, you have a plan in place and you're ready to go. Are you finding that locals are building out those attributes one, and then are they making this discoverable and available for other folks who are running these models? Are you seeing building footprint data being made available to you know neighbors and other mission partners? Yes, yeah, definitely. I, I, I am definitely seeing it. And I think the more we as a community can encourage local, local communities and local, you know, and, and states to, to do that, the better we're going to be because we have to share that information to get more accurate results. Awesome. Well, I don't know how we're doing on time. But that's all the questions I have for you, Catherine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Catherine, thank you so much for a very uh, informative uh, presentation. And Terry, we really appreciate you facilitating us some of the questions. Uh, well, it looks like uh, next up is uh, Brian Blake, and we look forward to having Brian jump on and uh, switch over to his slides. And your slides are showing up well, Brian. All right, my, uh, my mute button went away, so can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Clear as All right. Me. All right. And uh, I am here today with you all. Um, so thanks for having me today. I'm not going to keep my video on the whole time, but appreciate the opportunity uh, to be with everyone here at the Inspire uh, Summit and to discuss our uh, earthquake resilience projects and how new technologies can support those areas. Um, so just real quick during the presentation of today, I'll provide a brief overview of the pre-earthquake rapid visual screening process, uh, the QSEC RVS app, uh, as well as uh, we'll talk a little bit uh, at the end about some upcoming free training uh, opportunities that are being provided by FEMA um, that you might be able to use uh, some of these technologies uh, with. So we've looked at kind of the the, the macro level, and I'd like to kind of get down to the micro level uh, with, with my presentation. And it's no secret that the central U.S. is earthquake country. Um, and each year, there are several hundred earthquakes in the region across several seismic zones, uh, including the New Madrid seismic zone, which runs from Mark Tree, Arkansas, up through New Madrid, Missouri, and into southern Illinois. There's the Wabash Valley seismic zone um, in, in southern Indiana and southern Illinois as well. There is the eastern Tennessee and southern Appalachian seismic zones. Um, and each one of those is capable of producing a damaging earthquake at any time. Uh, each year there are, there are hundreds if not thousands of earthquakes um, across uh, multiple state region. And the USGS estimates that in, in the New Madrid seismic zone, there's um, around a 40, upwards of a 40% probability uh, of a magnitude 6.0 or greater earthquake in any 50 year window of time. And depending on magnitude and location uh, of the earthquake, along with other factors, depth of the earthquake, site geology, et cetera, um, such an event could have real and lasting consequential impacts on uh, individuals and communities as well as the national economy. So it's because of that hazard that um, Q 
CUSEC, the Central U.S. Earthquake Consortium, uh, we were formed. And we're a 501c3 nonprofit uh, based in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. We were established in 1983 to really focus on earthquake risk reduction and resiliency in this part of the country. So we work primarily with the at-risk states uh, in the central and eastern portion of the U.S. Our member states are those that you see there in our logo with our board of directors uh, being made up of the state emergency management directors in our eight member states plus two directors from outlying states. So we support FEMA uh, in states in our region one of many organizations across the nation that are part of the National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program. It's called NEHRP, and that was first enacted by Congress in 1977 uh, and is, is a very active program today across four federal agencies and, and numerous uh, organizations such as CUSEC. So one area we focus on is using technology to improve earthquake resilience um, through risk identification and understanding. And, and that's gonna be uh, the topic of our presentation today. So as we get started, uh, it's important to note that many buildings in the central US, um, they were built without you know, any understanding of the earthquake threat. Many buildings here are 50, 60, 70, 100 years old. Um, and they weren't built, they, they were built without incorporating any seismic strengthening measures uh, during the construction process. And in our region, there are at a minimum um, hundreds of thousands of buildings that could be vulnerable to an earthquake. And so without a basic screening process to identify and categorize those buildings which might be vulnerable and then those which are, might not be vulnerable, it's hard for communities and facility owners, critical infrastructure services to have even like a basic level of understanding uh, of their own level of earthquake risk. So to support that understanding of risk, FEMA created a building inventory methodology um, known as FEMA P154 rapid visual screening. Um, the whole name is rapid visual screening of buildings for potential seismic hazards. And it's a mouthful, so we'll just call it P154 or RVS uh, interchangeably throughout today. And this was developed uh, by the Applied Technology Council originally for FEMA, and it's been most recently updated in 2015. And this is a first pass building inventory and screening uh, process with two levels of screening. So level one, uh, identifies basic information and observable hazards. Um, people that are trained in the methodology can perform level one screenings. Level two screenings are a bit more detailed uh, and need to be performed by an engineer. So the RVS process, it uses prescribed methods uh, for, for doing these level one and two screenings. Uh, it has a scoring system that helps determine a, building, a building's relative seismic safety. So observations are recorded on a standardized form uh, and these assist during the, in, in calculating the building score. And that score can range anywhere from a zero to, dis, to about six, depending on observed conditions. And by completing this RVS process and an inventory, uh, building owners facility managers, local governments, et cetera, um, they can use that data to better prioritize where to focus their own earthquake mitigation efforts. For instance, community, they can use the program to screen their critical facilities, schools, police stations, fire stations, shelters, et cetera, and identifying which buildings might be more or less vulnerable and then taking appropriate steps and mitigation actions as necessary, including identifying which buildings, you know, should there be an earthquake, um, might be most vulnerable and that they need to investigate first. Uh, so it's, it's, got, it's somewhat of a pre-earthquake screening, but it also has post-earthquake um, implications as well, or applications. Um, so to note, RVS is not a detailed seismic 
uh, evaluation such as like tier one ASCE 41, 17, if you're familiar with that, um, this is kind of a starting point. And, you know, it does have specific training requirements. Uh, it's usually offered by FEMA and others several times throughout the year, which again, we'll mention a little bit about that at the end. So the P154 uh, process uses data collection forms as mentioned to help determine potential vulnerabilities. Here is shown a level one form. Um, that's the initial screening that would be done uh, when you're looking at a building. Depending on the region of seismicity, there are one of five forms to be used. So all the way from low to very high, there are separate forms for each one. And the level of seismicity um, is determined through a process similar to um, uh, what's shown here in the map that you can look at based on the county you're in, you can select the appropriate form. And then there are other detailed ways to get the correct form. But all of the forms have similar form fields that, that capture basic building information, um, lat long, year of construction and other fields. And then they have the scoring matrix, which is used to determine the score of the building. So the scoring system begins with a basic starting score uh, varying based on one of several building types, including like wood frame, steel frame, concrete, precast and masonry construction, as well as modular uh, housing, mobile homes. Um, as an example shown here, a steel moment frame um, building has in a high seismicity zone has the basic score of 2.1. And depending on the form you're using, the basic score would change. And factors that affect a building score, uh-oh, factors that affect a building score include the seismicity level, the building instruction type, uh, vertical and plan irregularities, the age of the building, soil type, etc. And so points are added or subtracted uh, from a building score based on these factors. And then buildings that score uh, above a 2.0 are generally considered life safe and they don't need additional evaluation. Um, they may need some non-structural things to happen, but generally they're considered life safe. Buildings that are below a 2.0 um, can have a level two screening performed by an engineer or, or be recommended for a more detailed seismic evaluation. So an example of how the RVS process can be used is at a local government level, identify the critical facilities. Um, here, this is an example of a county in Mississippi where they did level one and two screenings, where they surveyed um, seven facilities with 17 individual structures. Seven of those were unreinforced masonry, which are the worst performing buildings during an earthquake that, that could be had. So 10 of those buildings um, were identified that needed uh, more detailed evaluation. And, and there was also a non-structural review. Um, and they use that to update their local mitigation plans, secure contents, et cetera. And once those mitigation plans are updated and the vulnerable facilities are identified, they're able to then use that information, that data to apply for mitigation funding. Another example is in Kentucky. Um, we did a project, an RBS project at a long-term care facility. Um, we did level one and two screening on one facility camp, one campus with that had four distinct building sections. Most of them were URMs. One of them was a newer addition and, and it screened out. The facility, um, they decided, you know, they're not going to do retrofits to this building because they're going to plan to build a new facility, but they use the process to, to be able to identify what potential hazards they need to look out for in their, in their next uh, construction project. In Missouri, a final example, um, their Seismic Safety Commission has since 2013 been screening schools uh, in moderate to high risk areas of the state. They've done 21 school districts uh, in that time and more than 275 buildings have been screened. Uh, and they're looking at right now, transitioning um, their old paper-based process of RVS to a digital, um, digital model and digital transition. So 
to help with that digitization uh, of the RBS process, such as in, in that last example there and these others that we reviewed, we created a GIS based application that assists in that data collection, risk identification and analysis aspects of the RBS uh, process. So the target audience for this are local and state and federal governments. Uh, critical facility owners, school districts, healthcare organizations, hospitals and the like, and others that might be looking to understand and quantify their risk. So the application is comprised of several customized software components, uh, including Esri's ArcGIS Online and Survey123 products. Um, there are three main components that include a a customized data collection form that's aligned with the P154 standardized forms. There's a dashboard map for accessing uh, results of the data that's entered. And then there's a reporting and data export function. Um, and again, all of these are done within um, a digital framework. Uh, so supports the digitization of this process. And the next slides, uh, I'll walk through several of the components that make up the app. Um, I should point out that the a lot of the development for this was supported from both uh, DHS, SNT, uh, as well as the FEMA NEHRP program. So we appreciate that support in, in helping us bring this project to fruition. The first component uh, is is the data collection form. It's again, a customized form based on Esri Survey123 application. The data that's collected here has the same information that's on uh, the FEMA P154 standardized form. It automatically calculates those modifiers like we talked about um, based on where the building is located. And as data is being entered, those, those calculations are just being done in the background. Um, the example shown here, the building got a level two score and was considered life safe and does not need further evaluation. In the, in the form itself, in the Survey123 app, uh, as the user's filling it out, they can attach photos, sketches, other documents, and insert comments, uh, and then submit that form. And then once it's submitted, the data is kind of transposed in the background into a, into a GIS point. Uh, onto, a, onto a layer in ArcGIS Online with all those attributes from the form carried over. And that, that data that's submis that submitted is what the basis is for the P154 reports later. So once the form's completed, you can go back to the dashboard and display all of the information about the buildings uh, that you've collected. Each each entry contains a pop-up window where you can see the notes, the score, um, et cetera. And you can, of course, customize the dashboard to show additional layers um, that, that might be relevant, such as seismic hazard or, or uh, relevant um, proximity to other critical facilities. Um, within the dashboard, you also have the ability to edit entries by the way of an edit tab on the lower portion of the window. So it's recommended though that a GIS administrator creates a password protected account for, um, for administering and editing features using that dashboard and then create a separate view only dashboard with the editing capability removed. Um, also within the dashboard, we click on a feature, you can access the standard FEMA P154 report um, you just click on the feature and then click view FEMA P15 report. And then that downloads a, into a new browser a window. Uh, a browser window, it opens a tab up where you get to see a preview of the report. And then the user can download that report into Microsoft Word and update that. It's again, this is the standard P154 report. So we're we're kind of coming back to what, what was um, originally created by FEMA. Um, and this is what engineers use and what would be um, put in with plans and, and things like that. And so this can be further manipulated uh, or used in planning and documentation. So the data that's been entered in survey one, two, three is shown here in, in blue text. 
Lastly, um, the user can use the dashboard to export data into Excel spreadsheets, into the HAZIS uh, compatible format for the comprehensive data management uh, system tool for HAZIS. Um, and, and that can allow for user defined facilities uh, and, and advanced ri uh, building risk modeling to be performed uh, using FEMA's HAZIS program. Again, that's done in what's called CDMS. Once that data has been exported from the dashboard for use in HAZIS, you can bring it into CDMS, create a user-defined facility database, and then that uh, database can then be analyzed for site-specific loss estimations rather than census tract or, or county level um, analysis. And that can be done through the HAZIS advanced engineering building module. And so that provides uh, user-defined facility results uh, on, on those items you see here, casualties, economic losses, structural and non-structural losses. Again, that's site-specific. So big benefits of, of RVS and the RVS app is, of course, um, performing RVS in general will help communities, critical facility uh, owners identify their potential risks and prioritize mitigation actions as appropriate. Um, it's n our RVS is not a trivial, trivial undertaking, but it is the best first pass um, screening method available. And, you know, again, one of the main points is to know what not to screen. And so that this method helps, helps um, save time and avoid investing in screening buildings for earthquakes that may not need any retrofit whatsoever. And by using these technologies such as GIS and uh, our RVS app, um, you can move from this paper to digital realm. You can go do hazardous loss estimations and, and advanced analysis in that risk and risk identification aspect um, of your RVS project. Uh, the RVS app is free, and I'll talk about how to get it on the next slide. Um, it doesn't cost anything to obtain. However, it's on you to customize it and, and, uh, and own the ArcGIS online account organization that it's installed within. And that's you know something that uh, most people on this call probably have access to already. So, But it does require um, AGOL to be able to use. So how do you get the app? Um, we have an ArcGIS Online hub page. You see the link there, and I'll post it uh, in the chat when I'm uh, done with the presentation. On the page, there are several components. There's an area where you can um, test drive the, the Survey123 app, um, test drive the demo, the reporting feature, and the export feature, and those sorts of things. And then there's also a transition tool where it uses ArcGIS Online notebooks to migrate the components of the template um, that we've created into a folder within your own AGOL organization. And those components include the appropriate Survey123 forms, the web maps, the feature services and dashboard, et cetera. Um, and this, this enables administrators with a kind of off the shelf uh, solution for deployment for this app. Um, again, RVS, .qsec.org, that will get you to our hub page. Um, in February, we did a full length webinar on this app and I'll post a link to that in the chat a little bit later as we go on. Um, there is some specialized training that's needed to do RVS. FEMA is having a free training on May the 13th that's online, if any of you are interested in that. And so, so this is the, the basis for which you'd, you'd perform an RVS. It's, it's pared down from the full length eight hour in-person course to support uh, virtual, but uh, it, it should be pretty beneficial. And if you'd like, you know, I'll post a link to that. And also if you'd like, there are um, a way, there are other earthquake trainings that FEMA provides that you can um, get access to by signing up for that link there in the survey monkey uh, link that's on the bottom of the slide. I'll post that. Um, in closing, uh, again, would really like to acknowledge our partners, uh, including DHS, SNT, uh, and FEMA's NEHRP program for their support uh, of the development of this app. 
uh, and of our overall earthquake risk reduction program. Um, it's been essential for helping us adopt, uh, develop and adopt these technologies uh, to improve resilience. So my contact information is there and um, I'll go ahead and start my video again. If you'd like to reach out to me directly, please feel free. Uh, thanks again and uh, happy to take any questions that there are. Brian, thank you so much. Uh, it's exciting to see uh, technology being leveraged uh, like y'all are doing there in the central part of the U.S. Uh, we have gotten a couple of questions and uh, we've tried to answer a few of those uh, online. But in the process of kind of gathering data in that uh, beautiful sunny day environment and capturing it through the application, um, one of the questions that was really asked is, all right, now an event has occurred. Uh, have y'all looked at pre-populating that data into kind of like that starting block uh, in your post-incident assessment on those forms? Uh, can you talk maybe about anything you've tried or experienced regarding that? Yeah, it, it can be customized to do that um, for sure. You know, with GIS administrator can add a few additional fields to support the post earthquake efforts, but um, a lot of the a lot of the post earthquake efforts are, you know, if there's a major earthquake in Memphis, um, the majority of facilities that are going to be impacted, the majority of buildings are going to be residential, and those are not necessarily ones that that you would even include in uh, like a citywide RVS project because they're all wood frame. They mostly perform kind of well or better than like an unreinforced masonry facility. The ones that you would include in the RVS pro project are the schools, the police stations, the fire stations, the shelters. And those, um, yeah, it would make sense to, to be able to customize that. And that's something we're looking at for, for the long term is to kind of how to marry those two specifically for um, local government, but as on a like on a broad scale, like a citywide application, it it's it's kind of hard, kind of a moot point to do because even though houses may be damaged and may may need to be evaluated for safety afterwards, those aren't necessarily going to be um, you know prioritized like like RVS is intended to do. But no, that, that's great, Brian. Um, you know, we're fortunate to have a, a couple of representatives from uh, DHS Science and Technology on the call today. Um, is there anything y'all would like to add to uh, the conversation around uh, this great work that y'all partnered with uh, uh, CUSAC on completing? Yeah, this is Ron Langham with S&T. Um, Brian, a uh, question I had for you, the uh, modifications of this tool, have you guys adapted it to do other things um thus far no we're we're still kind of in the deployment phase we're doing some projects like i said in missouri we've got one upcoming in tennessee um, a big focus area for fema neherp is that that risk identification and critical facility inventory um, so initially this data that's being collected um, here it's going to be taken then and put into hazards. We'll do some loss estimations and run some scenarios and those sorts of things. So that's kind of our, our next step is to kind of get states using it um, and then get it down into the hands of the local level. And data that's gathered um, can certainly, because there's quite a bit of information that's being input into this um, system or that can be input into it, that data can then be used for you know, a number of other projects. Um, it's, you know, once the data's in there, it's in there and you can, you can take it from there. Uh, Brian, are you looking for some feedback and input from uh, some of the states outside of CUSAC that really could leverage this tool and this capability and, you know, kind of integrate it into their preparedness? Yeah, sure. Uh, anybody that, <laughs> that wants to test drive it, um, take it for a spin, test out the transition process, would be happy to receive feedback and, you know, help make improvements. Um, I saw a question too about the reporting. Um, the reports are not 
built out of the feature reports from survey one, two, three. They're, they're built out of a scripting process. It's happening on the back end on our Amazon um, cloud infrastructure, for lack of a better word. Um, so when, when anybody transitions this to their organization, um, there's, there's a back end transaction that happens when you generate a report that is a one time transaction and the data is not stored anywhere, um, it's just downloaded to your computer. Sounds good. Well, uh, Brian, thank you so much for being a part of uh, today's roundtable and uh, discussions and feedback provided today. Thanks for having me here, everyone. Appreciate it. Okay, as we uh, kind of get ready to wrap up this session on emerging technology for preparedness, uh, you know, one of the themes that I saw kind of carry throughout the entire uh, discussion was as it relates to operationalizing these resources and these tools to make better decisions at the local level. Uh, you know, many times in the past when uh, emerging technology was developed or was presented, uh, it really never connected with the ability to operationalize that. So, you know, when you uh, look at what the work that uh, Hank's are doing at the National Integration Center as they're building out that cloud environment with a single platform or resources, it really is helping uh, the folks at the level, local level. Then when I think about uh, Catherine, Kathleen, uh, Catherine and her activities uh, uh, that they've been working on with that uh, AI, how does it down, you know, looking at how it's going to really help us prioritize that decision making so that I know, hey, shelters are my number one issue uh, this morning, or is it debris removal? So, you know, that decision making opportunities uh, that are going to be available to us uh, a lot more efficient, they're going to be more effective and allow us the ability to uh, take some of this machine learning capabilities if integrated into our resources locally and improve uh, maybe our capabilities. And at the end of the day, it's about service delivery and how do we take care of our citizens and our community. And if the, those resources uh, allow us to do that, uh, that's very exciting to see the evolution and the development of that. And then I tell you, Brian, I tell you, I love the, uh, the opportunity to see the work that y'all have done and how you allow communities now to, in that blue skies, to take that snapshot of their community and some of those areas that we do use for shelters like our schools and some of our high risk areas like nursing homes and identify, hey, is this gonna be a hard environment or is this something that's gonna uh, provide a significant concern or risk in the event of a threat of an earthquake? So having all these uh, uh, items available and uh, we appreciate everybody sharing the information that they have around uh, the emerging technology. And like I said, I love the opportunity that we have with regards to operationalizing uh, these tools and uh, helping us here in the future. Uh, we appreciate everybody's uh, participation today and we'll be excited to jump on our uh, next presentation coming up here at three o'clock. Uh, we've got a great uh, team coming together to talk about uh, things that uh, are around the pandemic efforts over the course of the last year uh, and excited to uh, see that presentation and uh, have everybody participate in that. Uh, thank you all so much for today, and we'll look forward to seeing you all back in about 30 minutes. Have a good afternoon.